Hello, everyone. I wonder if I could ask you to take your seats so that we can get started with this um, lecture and the performance. I want to welcome everyone and thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Allison Keith, and I'm the director of the Jackman Humanities Institute here at the University of Toronto. It's my pleasure and privilege to welcome you to the second annual Jackman Lecture in the Humanities. We are here today to celebrate humanities scholarship at the University of Toronto, and especially the humanities scholarship of Naomi Seidman, Chancellor Jackman Professor of the Arts in the Department for the Study of Religion and the Center for Diaspora and Transnational Studies. But before I turn the floor over to Professor Anna Sternschuss, well known to you all, I know, as the director of the Center for Jewish Studies, who will introduce Professor Seidman, I'd like to say something about the Jackman Humanities Institute, our goals and activities. The JHI was established as the result of the generous gift of a former chancellor of the University of Toronto, the Honorable Henry N.R. Jackman. We're most grateful for his generosity and foresight in ensuring that the study of all the humanities disciplines and the qualitative social sciences will have a long and secure future at the University of Toronto. I also want to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. Since the semester began last month, I've been reflecting on the multiple and intersecting absences of indigenous cultural signifiers on the U of T's St. George campus, where we're assembled this afternoon. I'm especially uh, reflecting on the erasure of indigenous people's relationships to the lands and waters of the delta of Tequeranto. I want to acknowledge the presence and labors of generation upon generation of Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee nations here in Tequeranto, with special recognition of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. In addition to other foundation treaties, some between indigenous nations, and others with the Canadian crown and nation state, these lands and waters are part of the dish with one spoon agreement, which is concerned with taking only what we need, leaving enough for the next being and cleaning up after ourselves. In this spirit, I want to encourage us to reflect on the millennia of indigenous presence in this gathering place and the resilience and resurgence of indigenous cultural practices on this territory, in this community, and across Turtle Island today. And now I'd like to acknowledge the presence of my colleagues from the Department for the Study of Religion and the Center for Jewish Studies, and invite Professor Anna Sternschuss to the podium to introduce our speaker this afternoon, Professor Seidman. Anna. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I was thinking that as I was uh, preparing for this lecture that it's very rare when uh, a colleague joins the University of Toronto and has nothing short of a transformative impact on our academic life here. When Naomi Zeidman joined the faculty of the University of Toronto a few years ago, um, her work, her um, talent, and her insight and her creativity literally have transformed a number of departments here. For example, at the Department of Religion, she immediately connected with a number of people, started working in this, in, um, I'm looking at Pamela Klassen here, the, uh, you know, in the religion and public sphere uh, project, started teaching together with people, thinking about how to talk about Judaism in the context of uh, uh, public sphere, created undergraduate and graduate courses on uh, uh, Bible translation, for example, <clears throat> and brought the passion for translation studies uh, here into the Department of Religion, <clears throat> excuse me, Center for Comparative Literature. Oh, thank you, and brings me water too, so the <laughs> full service. Uh, at the Center for Diaspora and Transnational Studies, she helps to facilitate dialogues with uh, uh, colleagues and graduate students and undergraduate students, her courses uh, push the boundaries of our imagination. For example, right now she's teaching a course on diasporic superheroes. You can ask her about that uh, later. And um, where do I even start with this Antenna Baum Center for Jewish Studies, where right now she works as a graduate director. Thanks to Naomi, we got exciting graduate student 
projects, and um, uh, I will tell you in a second about her scholarship and briefly. But I do want to say that one does not come across a scholar who works on and feels comfortable in a multitude of languages, has, is comfortable with interdisciplinary perspective, and this work takes humanities at U of T and internationally forward, and I'm extremely privileged and fortunate to have Naomi as a colleague. Now, uh, in her bio, which was posted on the website, I loved how it said her fourth book and her fifth book, like who even starts with a book number one, book number two? But I will tell you that her first book did create the field of comparative literature, Yiddish and Hebrew literature, brought in the gender into the discussion of those fields and essentially enabled these fields of studies to be taught and studies studied at a number of universities around the world. Um, she is a 2016 Guggenheim Fellow. Her fourth book, Sarah Schneer and the Beis Yaakov Movement, A Revolution in the Name of Tradition, won a National Jewish Book Award in Women's Studies in 2019. Her fifth book is about to be published. It's called In the Freud's Closet, Psychoanalysis and Jewish Languages, and it's going to come out in, at Stanford University Press. Now, she also um, created and uh, um, pr produced or ran, read, authored a podcast called Heretic in the House, and I haven't asked Naomi how many listeners it have, but I can tell you anecdotally, and it's humanities, so it's okay, we can, that <laughs> <laughs> literally everyone in the field of Jewish studies has listened to this podcast and has opinions on it. If you haven't yet, heretic in the house, Google it, well, maybe after this talk, and uh, have a listen yourself. It was produced uh, with the Shalom Hartman Institute in North America in 2022. And um, one of the ways that Naomi works on her projects is to bring together not just, uh, you know, um, not, not producing just books and uh, other academic products on paper, but she's thinking of bringing together artists and scholarship and creating new ways to uh, present and to analyze the research. And today you will benefit from this cutting edge approach. Um, the um, talk, the program today, uh, the title of which you see on the screen, Naomi is not just uh, speaking alone, but you see that she is working together with artists. It's uh, my greatest pleasure and honor to briefly introduce them. Basa Schechter is not a new face here, has uh, been to Toronto a number of times working with Naomi on a number of projects related to Beis Yaakov movement, but uh, I will tell you that Basa Schechter is an American singer-songwriter, multi-instrumentalist, composer, producer, cantor, and a music teacher. She is also the leader and the founder of the folk band called Pharaoh's Daughter and has released two solo albums. She collaborated with a number of groups, um, Darshan and Epicurus, and uh, she was raised in a Hasidic Jewish community, and I think this project has a lot of personal connections, um, working with Naomi uh, Zeidman on the uh, Beis Yaakov project. And next to Basse is uh, Aviva, our own Aviva Chernik, one of the uh, leading uh, Jewish uh, musicians, mu musicians performing Jewish music here in Toronto. She's one of the spiritual leaders of Beit Tzedek congregation, an amazing performer of Yiddish and Hebrew music. I unfortunately I don't have an official bio, but I strongly recommend that you Google Aviva Chernik and uh, uh, have a listen of her unbelievable, uh, original, and uh, really um, insightful performances. So with that, please welcome Naomi Zeidman with the talk, Remembering the 93 Sexual Violence, Ultra-Orthodox Holocaust Memory Performance. Thank you. Hashem lo yivne bay 
Yes, Shavamlu Bonato, Emashem Lo Ishma, dear Shavashaka Shome, Emashem Lo Yevne Bais, Shavamlu Bonato, Emashem Lo Ishma, dear Shavashaka Shome, Hine, Hine, Loyado, Loyado, Veloisha, Loyado, Loisha, Shome. January 8th, 1943, a shocking report appeared in the New York Times with the headline, 93 to Suicide Before Nazi Shame. The story involved a group of girls and young women associated with the Orthodox girls' school system, Beis Yaakov, who in the Krakow ghetto, misrepresented in the Times as the better known Warsaw ghetto, swallowed poison rather than be taken as prostitutes by German soldiers. One of the girls, Chaya Feldman, smuggled a letter out of the apartment where they were being held in preparation for the soldier's visit. It was this letter which reached the school administrator in Switzerland and was forwarded to the head of the Beis Yaakov Committee in New York that formed the basis for the New York Times report. And I'll read a little bit from the letter. My dear friend, Mr. Shankolovsky in New York, I do not know whether this letter will reach you. Do you know who I am? We met at the house of Mrs. Schneerer and later in Marienbad. When this letter will reach you, I will no longer be among the living. Together with me are 92 girls from Beis Yaakov. In a few hours, all will be over. On July 27th, we were arrested and thrown into a dark room. We had only water. We learned David by heart and took courage. We are girls between 14 and 22 years of age. The young ones are frightened. I am learning our mother Sarah's Torah with them, that it is good to live for God, but it is also good to die for him. Yesterday, we were given warm water to wash, and we were told that German soldiers would visit us this evening. Yesterday, we all swore to die. Today, we were taken to a large apartment with four well-lit rooms and beautiful beds. The Germans don't know that the bath we took is our purification bath before death. Today, everything was taken from us and we were given nightgowns. We all have poison. When the soldiers come, we will take it. Today, we are together and learning the confession all day long. We are not afraid. Thank you, my good friend, for everything. We have one request. Say Kaddish for us, your 93 children. Soon we will be with our mother, Sarah. Yours, Chaya Feldman. The shocking news spreads quickly through the Jewish world, far beyond Beis Yaakov circles. The martyrdom of the 93 occasioned memorial events and charity drives, sparked poetry and plays, was mentioned in rabbinic sermons, and in the land of Israel inspired the naming of streets, parks, and a grove of trees in honor of the young martyrs. Not only Mr. Shankolevsky, but many other men and women said Kaddish for the 93, one woman reportedly for 50 years. 
The letter from Chaya Feldman was translated into many languages, often under the title, The Last Will and Testament of the 93. In the 1950s, the first historians to study the letter focused on its authenticity, soon reaching the consensus that it was a pious fiction. But this conclusion only deepens the interest and significance of the story. It's striking, for example, that a story about sexual violence during the Holocaust surfaced in 1943, since feminist historians tell us that the sexual violence that was part of the Holocaust was long suppressed, only very belatedly described by victims. What does it mean that this graphic story circulated while the, sto while the war was still raging? What does it mean that it described an incident of near rape in a community with the strictest sexual taboos and norms of female modesty? It's true that piety and pornography, virginity and violence, kitsch and death are a familiar brew in religious discourse, most emblematically in early Christianity. But this potent recipe is not unknown in Jewish discourse and from one perspective, was already part of how Beis Yaakov saw itself. Sorry. Beginning in 1927, Beis Yaakov administrators raised money and garnered support in the West by casting itself as a movement that rescued vulnerable girls from sex traffickers, in the parlance of the time, um, from the white slave trade. The story of the 93 is much darker, but it draws on this message by describing girls who are beyond rescue by Beis Yaakov administrators, but who have so internalized the values of sexual purity that they can protect their own virtue themselves. Beis Yaakov loved to quote the Mishnaic dictum that speaks of the importance of being a man where no man is present, reworking it to show that women, particularly the, base, the, the female founder of Beis Yaakov, could be leaders in the absence of rabbis willing and able to step forward. The reference in these cases was the crisis of young girls' defection from orthodoxy into the hands of secular radical movements or sex traffickers. But in this case, it's the girls, Sarah spiritual daughters, who step in to safeguard their virginity and protect Jewish honor. And they do so in the absence not only of the Jewish school administration, but of Sarah Schneerer herself, the beloved mother who died at the age of 51 in 1935. The story had many effects, as I said, beyond the school system and it apparently continues to. But for those in the know, it was also very firmly grounded in the particular details of Beis Yaakov. So let me lay out some of these here. Here's uh, uh, the photo of Sarah Schneerer, the one photo we have that only appeared in the archives a few years ago during the interwar period. I think a maybe more appealing and attractive drawing of her circulated and is still the official image of Sarah Schneerer in, uh, in, in, in the movement. What was Beis Yaakov? Well, it was first of all a school system, a network of school systems um, throughout initially Poland, and eventually throughout the whole world. And um, I'm going to ask Basia to sing the school song found in an archive a few while I was uh, researching my biography. Wir sehen, wie blieben wir lachen fällt. Wir sehen, ich hab weder getreu. Wir Kinder von Jankes gesellt. Lo, mir alle, lo, mir alle gehen in teures Welt. Lo, mir alle, lo, mir alle gehen in teures Welt. Wir lernen und singen zusammen. Wir leben und Frieden bei Nacht. Kein Sinne bei uns nicht verraten. Die Teure, sie ist unser Wald. Lo, mir alle, lo, mir alle gehen in teures Welt. Lo, mir alle, lo, mir alle gehen in teures Welt. Wir sehen und getreu unsere Beute. Wir hielten 
sein heilige Bot. Wir schweren zu halten die Treue, zu dienen dem einzigen Gott. Lo mir alle, lo mir alle, geht teures Weg. Lo mir alle, lo mir alle, geht teures Weg. Lo mir alle, lo mir alle, geht teures Weg. Lo mir alle, lo mir alle, geht teures Weg. Lo mir alle, lo mir alle. So from Be uh, Beis Yaakov, the first Beis Yaakov was founded in 1917 in Sarah Schneer's uh, dressmaker studio. She was a divorced seamstress with a vision for how to rescue Orthodox Jewry from the depredations of modernity. Um, by 1931, when this map was drawn, there were already 187 of these schools, many of them after school programs, but some of them full day programs or high schools, vocational schools, and four seminaries, teacher seminaries throughout Eastern Europe. Um, the photo of, uh, on the top right is of, this, this system was basically administered by a group of German Jewish middle class doctor rabbis, they're often called, um, since the men of the Hasidic men of Eastern Europe were um, unwilling to deal with women or even look at women or talk to women. So the Eastern European rabbis basically outsourced the school system, the girls' school system, to these more modern, um, sophisticated, richer men. And this map was drawn by this group of, uh, uh, someone that was hired by this group of men who was taking a tour of the school system. Um, the, uh, the crown jewel of this entire system was the Krakow Teachers Seminary. Um, it was funded by $60,000 raised by American Jews before there was even a single Beis Yaakov in the United States. Um, and uh, it was, uh, hard to get into. It was this kind of elite teachers of the school system. They went through a two-year program were immediately sent off to that picture that you saw. It's basically a Ponzi scheme. Immediately sent off to start schools. Um, and here are some photos. This school system, actually a surprising number of these schools, survived the war, including this building, which um, now houses a little museum to Beis Yaakov and a kosher restaurant. It overlooks the river in, in Krakow, and it's a, a, a truly beautiful space. That's what that space looks like now. That's what it, those lamps are still there. So um, that's the Krakow Teacher Seminary, at which this scene of the girls taking uh, poison uh, apparent was supposedly took place. Um, here are some more photos of uh, the. Uh, Gre this is actually from a family archive um, in Montreal, and an ast astonishingly well documented uh, Beis Yaakov journey. And um, uh, Devira Eppelgrad, who's one of the, that's her graduation photo there. There's her actual graduation certificate. And there's a picture of her going on a celebratory hike after she graduated. And this is a picture of her class in front of, uh, hiking was a, hiking and nature worship, let's say, was a big part of Beis Yaakov culture. Um, oops, I meant to provide the names of all these places. But just as important, particularly in the after school programs, was performance. So Sarah Schneer herself was a playwright, um, and uh, it was a marketing tool for the uh, secular girls would beg their parents to allow them to go to an Orthodox school because that's where the plays were happening. Um, and as you can see, there's uh, 
uh, many, many, many photos from many different towns of school plays in Beis Yaakov. Um, and when you ask people what did you learn in school, you get you hear in the Holocaust Memorial Archives, there's this kind of blank stare. And then you say, what else do you remember from the school? And they go, ah, the plays. So um, here is just, um, uh, there's an advertisement. You can see three scripts by Sarah Schneer on the left. And here you have a poster. Some of these were really elaborate productions with posters all over town. And uh, down at the bottom, you, say, An, you see Eingang nor Freien, entrance only for women. So part of this uh, amateur culture is that it's men are not welcome to participate. Um, just say a little bit more about another aspect of this, uh, this school system with eventually hundreds of schools across Eastern Europe and then Central Europe and now around the world. We've counted 835 schools, I think, in the Besiaco project. Um, along with that, there was also a uh, youth movement called Benos. As if that weren't enough, there was also a youth movement founded by the youth movement for younger girls called Basia. Um, and there is a Basia theme song, but we won't play it for you today, though normally we, we do for obvious reasons. Um, and then, and these are uh, basically, uh, the, the youth movement was for girls who were graduates of the after school programs but were already working, which would be the case for a 15 or 16 year old, who want, and the idea was to keep their orthodoxy alive through clubhouses and lectures and then vacations in the woods over the summer months. So we have many photos of girls on vacation in the woods of Poland. Um, what you see on the top right is the founding dais of the Neshe Agudas Yisrael, which is the women's organization of the orthodox political organization that Beis Yaakov came to be administered by. Um, and so uh, you got a, a youth movement, a younger youth movement, a women's organization, basically in 1929 when the, the youth, the, the women's organization was founded, uh, Orthodox women could now be surrounded by or embraced by um, a youth movement or a school system or an after school program, etc., to the end of her life, basically from cradle to grave. And there I couldn't help but put a picture. Uh, hopefully, it's not going to create any uncomfortable traumatic trigger memories. This is the Beis Yaakov that Basia and I uh, attended. It's the Beis Yaakov of Borough Park, it's kind of the flagship school. Uh, in case you are imagining something very homey, the school has at least 1,500 kids, would you say? Um, and it was one of the first ones uh, founded in North America, and um, it is to blame for everything we have to say about this. So um, uh, maybe just before we go into the Benos hymn, I'll just say that um, uh, a lot of the primary sources that I used, and I should also thank Anna Sternchis, who basically encouraged me to go to the archive and look for music, which hadn't occurred to me. Um, uh, a lot of the primary sources I use in my research are available for viewing. I recommend that you view them that way. It starts in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and then you get up to the Besiaco project at the very end. So what you're about to hear now is the, what's called the Benos hymn, which is the anthem of the, maybe I'll say one thing about it, which is, the, this, there was a, uh, in 1929, there was a, con, uh, what, what am I trying to say? The word, the word escaped me. There was a, someone wins a. Sally, Sally who day? <laughs> no. Anyway, there, you, uh, people wrote, the, the, this is the winning, uh, the one, the contest. That was the word I couldn't remember. There was a contest for the Benos hymn. And we actually have a few Benos hymns, and this is the one that won. And we didn't like it originally, but you fixed it up, and now we like it. Near the oyster welten tachter, vorne oyster welten folk. Beten dich Israels wachter, unser Arbeit gewehr folk. Hit uns ab vom fremder Knechtschaft, dann vom Gollus unser Reus. 
Mit dem Pflanzen deren Kindheit und dein Geist in dein Gesäus. Stark und mächtig, groß und lächtig, unser Streben Ziel erfolgt. Sein Getreie, die auf neue, teure Gott und jede Spuk. Komm zu unserer weiten Schwester, hast gewandelt schon genick. Warf die alle Weide Sores, kommen auf der Heim zurück. Sei gute, fromme Tochter, geht dein Stimm und unser Chor. Sei gute, fromme Mutter, fahren zukünftigen Dorf. Stark und mächtig, groß und lächtig, unser Streben Ziel erfolgt. Sein Getreie, die auf neue, teure Gott und jede Spock. Stark und wächtig, groß und wächtig, unser Streben Ziel erfolg. Sein Getreie, die auf neue, teure Gott und jede Spock. Das Nie ist von der Mutter Sorge und der Mutter Ifkes Geist. Tränen von der Mutter Lehe der Mutter auch ausreißt und der Mutter kann es viele und der Schwester Jehudis schwert. Hit das alle hit in Leben und in Herz sei es wert. Stark und mächtig, groß und lächtig und sie streben Ziel erfolg. Sein Geschrei in die auf neue, teure Gott und ihre Schwung. Stark und mächtig, groß und lächtig und sie streben Ziel erfolg. Sein Geschrei in die auf neue, teure Gott und ihre Schwung. Tonight, I'd like to draw the lens back from these fascinating young women at center stage to the less visible male actors and agents in the wings, the men who circulated their story in mandatory Palestine during the war. This story unfolds in one of the two major Beis Yaakov centers after the Holocaust, with North America being the other. Here, the Krakow Seminary students played a role within a transnational movement whose center was in the most horrific fashion failing to hold, whose future beyond the European homeland was still far from assured. My talk will focus on two small booklets published in Tel Aviv that are in that display there. Um, apparently the rare book room has one of them too. Um, the first with 30 pages on the right and the second with 39 pages, oh, the first uh, dated 1943 with 30 pages and the second with 39 pages dated from 1947. At first blush, they're remarkably similar. They both retell the story of the 93 through the letter from Chaya Feldman and frame her, her letter with supporting texts. Both booklets provide the same Hebrew translation of the full text of the letter called The Last Letter, here it is, The Last Letter of One of Our Holy Sisters in 1943 and The Last Will of the, of the 93 in 1947. But there the similarities end. Although the first brochure was published just a few months after the first reports broke, it's more expensively produced, reflecting the prestige of the editors, a group convened by the Tel Aviv rabbinate called the Committee for the Defense of the Honor of the Jewish Daughter. This group, which included politicians, academics, and rabbis, was already in existence before 1943. It was organized in response to a wave of reports that scandalized the Zionist public in 1941 and 1942 of Jewish prostitutes with Arab customers and Jewish women who consorted with British officials. This was the committee that in February 1943 organized the mass meeting at the Bilu Auditorium on Rothschild Boulevard, which drew thousands and in May issued the booklet with a selection of the speeches. 
The Bilu Auditorium was a far cry from the first base Yaakov in Tel Aviv, which had met in 1934 on a few park benches on the same boulevard before acquiring, finally, a modest school building in the neighborhood. The 1943 booklet was clear about who it was addressing. The loose women they hoped to shame into repentance with the story of our Polish sisters who killed themselves rather than be forced to have sex with a German soldier while these women had sex of their own free will with the non-Jew. The booklet ended with a plea to the confused Jewish daughter in the land of Israel O oh, you Jewish woman, daughter of an exalted and eternal nation, while your sisters in the blood-soaked diaspora relinquish their lives lest they be cast into shame, you, whom divine providence has safeguarded from this cruel fate, live free in the land which your nation is building as a haven for refugees. Is it so difficult for the sake of your family honor for you to relinquish not your young lives, but only, after the ch only the chase after an easy life that can only lead to ugly maladies. We beg you, O oh young Jewess, the honor of your nation is in your hands. Choose a pu pure life instead of staining our land, a family life that will carry on the chain of generations of the eternal people. The group that signed this prayerful missile to the young Jewish woman a missive to the young Jewish woman was led by Professor Rabbi David Pratow, the chief rabbi of Rome and Alexandria, who was waiting out the war in Palestine. The committee included the historian and literary critic Jacob Klausner, the psychologist Fischl Schneerson, and Rabbi Moshe Blau, leader of the organized Orthodox community in Palestine. The booklet had literary aspirations. Prato contributed a learned disquisition, complete with Latin citations, comparing Jewish and Christian notions of the body and soul, while Klausner provided a genealogy for the 93 in the rabbinic tale of the 400 boys and girls who jumped into the ocean en route to Roman brothels. The booklet cites two female speakers, Mrs. Dr. Giladi called on women to add another candle to their Sabbath candles for the 93. And the well-known Beis Yaakov teacher, Mrs. Rosa Shedlitsky, spoke of the Torah education that gave the girls the strength to make that ultimate sacrifice. This was really the most extended mention of Beis Yaakov in the booklet. By contrast, the more cheaply produced Brochure of 1947 was released by the Beis Yaakov Press in Tel Aviv and edited by Mayor Sharansky, the founder of Beis Yaakov in the Land of Israel, who was not on that first committee. Beis Yaakov appears everywhere in the 1947 booklet. There's a running footer um, with the Beis Yaakov slogans. There's the address of the main office, etc. cetera. Um, repeatedly reminding people where to reach them on Rehov uh, Grusenberg too, the main office. And this, this booklet also ends with a prayerful plea, not to the young Jewish daughter, but rather to Tel Aviv parents. Parents, when you read the moving story of these holy girls, think for a moment about what you are doing for your daughter's education no effort is spared in this booklet to connect the fledgling school in Tel Aviv with the one that produced the martyrs, juxtaposing, as you can see, photos of Beis Yaakov girls in Tel Aviv with others of Beis Yaakov girls in Poland. Sarish Nehru, too, is mobilized to, make, to cement the connection, as in, where's that centerfold spread, sorry. Oops, where is Sarish Nehru? Okay, sorry, that's missing. Um, as in the spread which shows the mother there's a, somewhere in that booklet you can see it of the mother and her daughters a connection that's literally made concrete when Beis Yaakov in Tel Aviv finally had a teacher seminary there was a, a, a mural of the Beis Yaakov teacher seminary in I think there still is in Poland um, in the front lobby 
But perhaps the main difference, the most significant difference between the booklets is that the 1947 booklet includes a stunning addendum to Chaya Feldman's letter, which is another much longer Yiddish letter translated into Hebrew too, by someone named Chana Weiss, who describes herself as a 94th student who managed to slip away from the others, but witnessed the suicide of the 93 from the alley outside. Um, Weiss sent this letter from Bogota, Colombia to Sharansky, lamenting that she had not merited to join her classmates in this holy act. She sets the scene and describes the school director, whom she doesn't name, calling on her students to be strong. And I'll read to you a little bit from this Hanna Weiss letter. My dear daughters, the time has come for you to carry out what you have learned. You are God-fearing girls, and the merits of our holy matriarchs and our mother's Sarishnera will surely protect you from the trials that await us. Her voice was choked with tears. The hushed weeping of dozens of girls could be heard in the hall, but not a single one of them broke the holy silence that reigned in the hall. Suddenly, there was the sound of rough footsteps and there appeared in the doorway the SS soldiers, their savage laughter interrupting the holy thoughts of the girls. You have three hours to prepare, then you will all be removed from here. The words of the SS leader thundered like the roar of a lion in the deep jungle. As the preparations proceed, as the day moves on, Weiss describes the following scene. The cries grew, grew louder, and then the youngest student asked, my dear teacher, I don't understand. How do they intend to defile us? The teacher embraced the, her and cried out tearfully, my dear pure child, you don't even know. Oh, almighty God, give me strength. Help me to carry out my plan. Many girls wept and others stifled their sobs. The director continued, yes, girls, they want to force us to give up what is most precious to us, the honor of our bodies and souls, to force us to tra transgress the boundaries of modesty the Torah erected around us. For you know that modesty was the major principle instilled in us in Beis Yaakov by our mother, Sarah Nehrer, may she rest in peace, etc. There can be no doubt that this letter is as fictional as the first. The names Chaya Feldman and Hannah Weiss are basically the Jane Doe's of Eastern European Jewish womanhood. I actually have a student here <laughs> at the University of Toronto named Hannah Weiss, who I don't see. Um, Bogota is conveniently far from Tel Aviv, in case anyone was asking any questions. And the director of the Beis Yaakov Seminary from 1933 until its wartime dissolution was this man, Yehuda Leib or Leon, and not a woman who might have spoken in the first person plural of our bodies and souls. Nice looking man. The girls all had a crush on him. The two booklets trace a complicated trajectory in 1943, the story of the 93 was of significance far beyond Beis Yaakov, doing the work of forging alliances among rabbis and right-wing Zionist intellectuals, combating the threat posed by female sexuality, among other things. By 1947, these alliances had fallen apart. Prato had returned to Rome, party politics, and I think died in a plane crash. Uh, party politics militated against this particular alliance, and the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising had fully taken the place of the 93 as the exemplary case of Holocaust heroism, and remains that way. The 93 remain on street signs, um, and in Tel Aviv, they're actually in the section of the city that's dedicated to what's called the Ghetto Fighters, which has you know Mordechai and Ulevich, and they're in the 93. Um, and they're a rare orthodox group to participate in that discourse. But they're remembered today, and they're commemorated today only within 
maybe with some few exceptions. I forget who was, uh, just told me that they were in a Yom Kippur service a few days ago. I think that was you, Emily, where the 93 were part of the... So they still appear every once in a while, but they're really part of ultra-Orthodox uh, Holocaust memory within Beis Yaakov. Um, the story is recited at assemblies, etc. And they function, um, they continue to function to help oddly market the school and connect it to the Krakow motherland. There are certainly also personal feelings that play a part. Oh, this is, I think, the centerfold that I was looking for. Um, the photograph of the Besiakov sisters in Poland, sisters, two old Besiakov girls, past and present, by virtue of all of us being daughters of Sarah Schneerer. Um, this particular photo includes Latka Sharanska. There she is, standing there. And there's her name, um, Latka Sharanska, Hey Yud Dalid, which stands for Hashem Yikom Daman, which is the orthodox uh, acronym that follows the names of victims of the Holocaust. May God avenge their blood. Um, and as it happens, Latka Sharanska is Mayor Sharansky's actual sister. And I should say Latka Sharanska, may God avenge her blood, is Mayor Sharansky's actual sister, although the language of sisterhood in this case is purely female um, in, in the text itself. This was an orphaned and scattered movement held together from Bogota to Palestine by frail threads of memory and symbolic kinship and um, in which Beis Yaakov itself bridged the chasm that had opened up in this chain of tradition. Um, the, I'll just read here. This is a, 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 another collection also available if you want to look at it on the table, published in the 40s by Mayor Sharansky um, and with the photo of Sarah Schneer, the angel in heaven, connecting the girls in Tel Aviv with the girls in, in uh, Poland. The story also salved the psychic wounds of ultra-Orthodox Holocaust um, experience. Um, and we know historians tell us, tell us that Orthodox Jews were particularly tarred by the shame of going like sheep to the slaughter. Um, there were multiple types of shame operating in the story of the 93. And not only the shame named by the New York Times headline, but also the more contagious shame that affect theor theorists tell us is part of shameful narratives, which overflows from victims to perpetrators to bystanders, witnesses, and even researchers. The story of the 93 Beis Yaakov girls is an early testament to the Holocaust as an episode in the history of shame. But if, it's, if it is so, it is also testimony to the countercurrents that were there from the start, the battle against shame um, that is enacted by thwarting Nazi violence and by sending the story out to those who could most appreciate it in the free world. This process was already stirring in the darkest days of the Holocaust. For religious Jewish men, singled out for a greater share of sexualized shame than their secular counterparts, the struggle to overcome shame was deflected and bolstered by the borrowed or fictional voices and experiences of their sisters and daughters, the Orthodox Jewish girls and women of Beis Yaakov. And this too was not an entirely new story. Um, one of the songs that Basia sang, the Benos hymn, um, was written by a man who won that 1929 contest. Um, and there you see him in his Hasidic garb when he, I think he won the contest when he was around 20 years old. Um, and there you see him having shorn off his side locks and joined the Communist Party. Um, and so Shmuel Nadler too um, took on the power of religious womanhood by speaking in the first person feminine plural as we the chosen daughters of a chosen folk. Stark and mechte, groys and lechte, goons, er schreven seal er folk, sein getreie die an neue, teure Gott um jüdisch folk. Stark and mechte, groys and lechte, goons, er schreven seal er folk, sein getreie die an 
In the time that I have left, I want to explore another dimension of this story. It's striking that in the 1947 document, Weiss provides us with the actual words spoken by the group of girls preparing for their own deaths, now given much more precise roles to play in the story. While Feldman speaks of the 93 rather vaguely as sisters, these are teachers, directors, students of different ages, and they're given personalities. The school director is shaky in what she's asking her younger charges to do. The youngest student is confused by the bleak talk of defilement. She has no idea what's going on, but is perfectly happy to go along with what everybody else is doing. Even the SS officers are given a voice. What I'm driving at is that Hannah Weiss was writing a script complete with detailed stage directions, roles for older and younger girls, and plenty of opportunities for any actor who might enjoy stomping around and laughing as savagely as an SS officer. And I was telling Allison that I actually, in two Beis Yaakov plays, my only lines were, you dirty too. <laughs> <laughs> This script starred Weiss herself, trembling in the alley as she witnessed the drama unfolding within, a stand-in for the audience watching it unfold on stage. She too longs to join in, like all those young girls that wanted to be part of what was going on in Beis Yaakov. I haven't found evidence that Weiss's letter was actually used as a script for a school play, but there are certainly plays enough that follow its general outlines. The theatrical traditions that shaped Beis Yaakov beginning with Sarah Schneer continue until today. And the display case shows that Sarah Schneer, in fact, wrote possibly her first play called Kana and Her Seven Sons, another martyrological play. And these traditions continues, con continue with plays often revolving around similar tragic and thrilling formulas in which female piety, heroism, resourcefulness, triumph over male savagery. The pedagogical aims of these plays are clear enough. Beis Yaakov, Beis Yaakov girls test their own virtues by playing them out on stage, preparing themselves for the seduction of the secular street. Um, and what I have here is a, a Sarah Blau's 2012 um, mystery, Hebrew mystery novel, which we're hoping to translate into English. Um, called Well Brought Up Girls, which begins with the disappearance of a young girl who's playing the role of Chaya Feldman um, in her school play about the 93, in which, in this novel, weaves the strands of contemporary Orthodox girlhood in Tel Aviv, but not only, um, with those dramatic events in the Krakow ghetto. Um, as the novel shows, the effects of these performances are not exhausted by their official pedagogical aims. The 1943 booklet produced by a group of men who included secular academics, a Sephardic chief rabbi, an ultra-Orthodox Ashkenazic rabbi, etc., was explicit in its aim, pleading with the young women of Tel Aviv to rein in their loose morals in recognition of what their Polish sisters had sacrificed to protect the honor of the Jewish people. The 1947 booklet, a narrower production spearheaded by the Beis Yaakov School in Tel Aviv, certainly had similar aims, but by lending theatrical detail to the story and providing a thicker view into the world of Beis Yaakov, it also had more tools at its disposal. The pleasures of the story, which I think can hardly be denied, are more intricately connected with Beis Yaakov these are not a random collection of girls ripped from their families, as in other Holocaust scenarios. These are girls who have constructed their own family connections, who share the same spiritual mother. Beis Yaakov was attempting to constrain their dangerous adolescent sexuality, but it also found ways to draw energy from it and to give the girls other kinds of freedom. 
Both letters dwell on the boon companionship of the girls and invite readers to imagine the warm baths, the white nightgowns, the intimate female spaces. As in Besiaco spaces, fathers are elsewhere, male administrators stay in their office, and husbands are part of a hazy future. In both letters, even the SS officers stay mostly off stage, even as they attempt to control the outcome. These scenes recited and performed over and over again in school assemblies and class plays display Orthodox girlhood on beautiful sets witnessed by new generations of Sarah's daughters watching from the audience and waiting for their own turn on stage. And Sarah Schneer, playwright, mother, founder, she watches too as they imagine her watching them. And I don't have the lyrics to the next uh, song that we're gonna play, but the lyrics, I'll just tell you, it's a song um, that says, I'm thinking about you more these days, Sarah Schneerer. Did you ever imagine in your town in Krakow when the first student came into your uh, studio, did you ever imagine us? Did you imagine the vision that would play itself out? Um, let's just show you that picture if we wanna talk about a vision that plays itself out. So it's basically a love song from a Besiakov student to Sarah Schneerer. חושבת עלייך יותר מתמיד דווקא ברגע הזה וחשה איך לבבך מרי לגודל המחזה אישה קטנה חייל יחיד מכל הרחובות האם צפי כזה עתיד או לא העז לקוות שפרפר בחלום תמיד ולא ידעת עדיין לאיזה האם שיער שיבואו ימים כמו היום הזה האם עלתה כזאת תמונה, כזאת תמונה בצירך, בקרקוב כשילדה ראשונה פיסה אל תוך הדרך. שהבטת בשתי עיניה ולחשת לשלום, האם ראית אז בפניה את פנינו היום? ובערב כשהלכה וקיווית שתחזור אלייך הצלחת לראות בחשכה את בית יעקב בלנייך שפרפר בחלום תמים ולא יודעת עדיין לאיזה האם שיער שיבואו ימים כמו היום הזה האם עלתה כזאת תמונה, כזאת תמונה בצירך, בקרקוב כשילדה ראשונה פיסה אל תוך הדרך. צאי עינייך ואי את כולן, איך נקפצו ובאו, הן מרימות לך את דקלן, כי כל שלהן שהלכו, בקרקוב כבר קבעו האורות, והיא הלכה ילדה לביתה, ראי מאז כמה דורות חוזרים אלייך איתה, שפרפר בחלום תמיד ולא ידעת עדיין איזה, האם שיער שיבוא ימים כמו היום הזה האם עלתה כזאת תמונה, כזאת תמונה בצירך, בקרקוב כשילדה ראשונה, פסעה אל תוך הדרך. The Committee for the Defense of the Honor of the Jewish Daughter had little to offer those Jewish daughters that could compete with the pleasures of a night on the town with a British officer or whatever payment they received from an, an Arab customer. Perhaps that is why that committee has disappeared into the archives where they rest in peace. By contrast, Beis Yaakov, publisher of the second booklet, survived and flourishes to this very day with at least five here in Toronto. 
It too requires these girls from an even younger age than the youngest of the 93 to make a host of religious sacrifices, small and large. But unlike the committee, Beis Yaakov compensates these girls with an array of pleasures. First and foremost, the pleasure of performance so familiar to Beis Yaakov girls past and present. The rehearsals and the costumes and the sets and the production, right? The production, any Beis Yaakov girls here? Um, <laughs> which takes place on a stage in which Jewish girls and women are called upon to play all the roles, even the rabbis, even the savage soldiers. In nurturing a culture of performance, Beis Yaakov found not only a more efficacious formula for social control, but also a surer way to combat shame than the Committee for the Defense of the Honor of the Jewish Daughter. Beis Yaakov substituted praise and pride for shame and excoriation, extravagant praise for the virtue and innocence and beauty and heroism of at least some Jewish daughters, beautiful martyrs who play out meaningful lives far from public view on stages visible only to their sisters with men forbidden from entering. I got. <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Pamela Clausen. I am uh, proud to be Noe's colleague, and I'm the chair of the De Department for the Study of Religion. And I'm just going to moderate the questions. I, she could do a very good job of it herself, but let's give her a little I think break. Like two or three people I don't know in this room. Excellent. Okay, exactly. And I'm so you know. Just raise your hands, and uh, I'm sure that uh, Naomi is happy to answer your questions. And there'll be a mic uh, brought to you because we are live streaming this, I believe. Should you like, Yaakov, like, have everybody do a rousing thing after the Q&A? Sure. Okay. Sounds good. 
Um, thank you, Nomi. I'm curious if you could share more about the um, kind of imagined familial ties between girls and uh, Sarah Schneer as a mother, um, as well as based off of as like a sisterhood. Can you talk more about those, um, what, it, what it means that that language is being used? Oh, okay. Um, you don't really need me. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, it's not uh, it's not that unusual, right? You know, the, the the language of sisterhood and symbolic sisterhood. What's so different about that language here uh, in Besyakov is that it it covers over all kinds of awkward and complicated realities, including the reality that this mother, so the, in, in what they say in Beis Yaakov is, unfortunately, Sarah was never able to have children, right, do you hear that? She was never able to have children um, uh, like the matriarch Sarah, who actually did have a child at the age of 90, um, right, this, she's our mother Sarah, Sarah Imenu, so there's a, a, it's not just that Sarah is our mother, it's Sarah, Mrs. Abraham, Sarah. It's funny, my mother, it just occurred to me for the first time. My mother's maiden name is Sarah Abraham. Um, I was just called the matriarch Sarah, Sarah Abraham. Um, the, the awkward fact that she wasn't a barren in the biblical sense, you know, which apparently lots of people were barren back in the Bible. Um, she was divorced, she was single. Um, so her motherhood, and then the way it always says that every Beis Yaakov girl is her daughter. So, so there's the, the kind of the, the, the weird awkwardness is also the signifier of her name. She's Mrs. Schneer, but she kept her maiden name. Um, all extremely unusual for a Hasidic woman. Um, she was actually, uh, she'd walk around the streets of Krakow, and people called her the Gigetta, which means the divorcee. Not a nice, uh, divorcee sounds like interestingly French, right? <laughs> it sounds like someone with lingerie, right? It matches. So, but no, a different kind of divorcee. Um, the, the other awkward um, uh, truth or his, historical fact that gets covered over by this language of sisterhood is and I know you sort of asked me what it feels like to be a sister. Um, the other awkward fact is that the basically the, let's say the, the pedagogical channels, the chain of transmission by which traditional Jewish life was passed along was no longer functioning. That was the crisis that Sarah Schneer was um, trying to address. And the way she addressed it was by removing girls from their traditional families because they, know, they were bored by their fathers singing at the Sabbath table kind of thing. So, and the way she did this is by bringing them into these, removing them from the family. So basically this whole language of sisterhood is on some level anti-family. In terms of what it feels like, it's a very, very deep connection. I don't know if I speak only for myself. I don't know if there are any other Beis Yaakov graduates in the room, but do you feel like it's, it goes pretty deep, even at, despite our having left that world? Absolutely. All the, all the indoctrinations. <laughs> like it's, you know, it's like there's, there's certain indoctrinations that you, at some point you have to make choices in your life, and you can't divorce yourself from what is the, the indoctrination and your own desires. Because the indoctrination is so embedded, and like you don't even know what, who, which, which part of you is you anymore. You have to follow the indoctrination because it's so strong. Right. I used to, I mean, I, I remember being like six years old and I loved the song. There's a song, a very sad song about Sarah Schneer, which we didn't sing for you because it's just too corny. In a little town in Poland. Uh, I love that song and I would cry. I don't know why. I was just like, so these are, I don't know, these are, you know, they, they don't entirely go away. And, and one of the things is like Basia and I, we have, or, you know, Aviva too, now you're part of it. We have these dreams of creating, uh, like, re of making records and things like that. And we bring people together from all walks of life. And suddenly it's like, it's such a big thing to have in common with someone to be, not just to have grown up orthodox, like that's what people know. It's like, okay, you, you come from a Hasidic home. It's way more specific than that because these are extremely sexually segregated societies. So what you share is like an 
a, a, a female upbringing. Female, isn't that, that sounds so, so old fashioned to talk about that. I'm interested to know if you've had the opportunity to bring your lecture and your scholarship to leadership of the Based Outcove movement and what the response has been. I really, uh, it's, it, it's very complicated because um, maybe some of you know that actually female voices, it's not just that men are not welcome to watch a, a play, female voices, singing voices may not be heard by men, by orthodox men. Um, if there's, even if, uh, you know, exceptions for immediate family, but basically the reason why these, you know, these girls are so into singing is because they're kept from singing, which is such a big part of orthodox and Hasidic life. So um, we have performed in New York, and my mother, who's a Beisia graduate of the Chernovitz Teacher Seminary, I mean, graduate, she didn't graduate, the war broke out, but um, my mother was there, but you know, my male uh, relatives would, would never step foot in that a scene, and what they're seeing is a bunch of women. So basically, the only people who could sing this song without being on the inside in this female sphere, which is pretty closely guarded as, a, as an orthodox space, are people who left the orthodox world, which is true for all. We have something called the Kol Isha Choir, which is, Kol Isha is the voice of a woman, and it's, it's the, the rule that says that women, those, those voices can't be heard. So the joke is we're making a choir about, with a bunch of people who are singing songs. In other words, it's complicated. And I have spoken in, um, at Orthodox synagogues a number of times. I've always been told very regretfully, no, you know, Basia is not welcome. <laughs> Thanks very much, Naomi. Um, that was wonderful. I have a question specifically about the memory of the 93. I understand um, the way in which you're using that as uh, essentially a script for pedagogical purposes and uh, as a way of representing the um, theatrical performative parts of the Beis Yaakov community. But I, um, I just wonder if we can push harder at this putative memory, the memory part of the memory mm. of the 93, mm -hmm. since it's, of course, a false memory. And I wonder if you do anything with that. Um, either in a future project or uh, if part of your discussion, the larger discussion that involves the memory of the 93 as analogous to a theatrical script factors in some of the um, very problematic aspects of this being a fictionalization. And um, I guess as a almost footnote to that question, I'm wondering how many of the um, um, disseminators of the memory of the 93 were aware that it was a fiction or a false memory. Yeah, that's a good, I mean, the first question sounded a little, um, a little theoretical, I, and the truth is, I've, I have spent a lot of time trying to get my wrap my brain around what to do with this fictional story, and or it's not even fictional is the wrong word. I guess apocryphal, or um, uh, you know, and what do you do with it if you're not, um, you know, I'm going to talk about its authenticity. How do you think about it in terms of, and do people um, do people understand it to be? false and nevertheless cite it at school assemblies. So one, I, I had a conversation with Elisheva Karlbach, do you know her? Um, she's a historian of early modern Germany and at Columbia University. And I asked her that question and she said, 
that she doesn't think we have enough genres to this, that the genre, in other words, the spectrum of possible genres that this might fit into, fiction, account, letter, script I tried. She said, we don't, you, don't, you haven't gotten there yet. Like, and, and you, it, we're not, it, it's not, you, you should recognize that you haven't gotten there. And if you start working with false and true, I mean, you know, that, that was all a bunch of fun in the 1990s, right, to be relativistic, and then, you know, along came fake news and all that. And so I, how do we think about, um, how, how do we get more nuanced w without becoming relativists and while insisting on reality? Um, how do we get our minds around a certain kind of, I think it has to do, a, it's, it's not that different from, you know, we were reading uh, Genesis 1 in our Bible translation class today, is that, what is that, right? What is the story and the idea that you're gonna say, it, it did, did it happen, did it not happen? I mean, all that. So we're dealing with something, I mean, obviously a cultural myth, I guess is the obvious way to think about it. And the fact that it didn't happen is almost irrelevant um, on some level. Um, and I mean, the other thing is, what do you do with this as a feminist, right? So this is, you know, there are people who are like, how can you, how can you say something nice about this? How can you, how can you tell a story that manages to extract a kind of positive message from this insane form of social control that no doubt messed me up and a lot of other people in a pretty deep way, right? Um, yeah, and, but I do feel like there's so, it's worth trying to get at that other thing too, what it is, why, why you don't just say this is patriarchal social control and that's a patriarchal religion and that's the end of the story. So, 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 so welcome to my brain. Thank you so much for this. <laughs> um, I am intrigued by everything, but I, I think I, one of the things that most intrigues me, and I'm wondering, um, just as a clarification, like factual question, uh, you said you were sort of looking at this as a, a script, right? Um, but is it the case, when you were talking about uh, shows that you were in, for example, uh, and you know, having the, the one line of like, Newton Ross or whatever, um, were, were those scripted versions of- I wonder if I should edit that out of the live stream. That was a little intense, wasn't it? <laughs> that, oh, I mean, that was, that was fast, <laughs> it was so fascinating. Um, are those script, in, in some ways, are those scripted versions of, of uh, the, the story of the 93? And if so, like, are, is it, Part, I mean, it's not that long a story. Like, is it part of a martyrdom thing where you've got like several martyrs? Is it specifically Holocaust related? Like, what's the, the context for that sort of thing? And who composed the script version of it? So I, I've never actually, so I've heard the story recited at school assemblies, but I've never seen it played out. But the school, the school plays, um, they're changing a little bit. People are beginning to write their own scripts. But the scripts, and they also, they have this tenant, they use a lot of Broadway music and they change the, yeah, is this, like, are you nodding because this, you, this is the same thing in where however you grew up? Because I know you were not a Bass Yaakov girl. Like, like or, or Simon and Garfunkel, so there's a lot of kind of taking, um, you know, Oliver, which actually is kind of anti-Semitic, and turning it into, like, they're little Jewish boys, and it, it, they love plays that have tons of male parts because everybody wants to be a boy in the play. Um, and there's very often um, anti-Semitism is, is just a regular thing. What would we do in a Beis Yaakov play without anti-Semitism? Sometimes there's communism. so. Sometimes there's communism and anti-Semitism. They're extremely formulaic. Have you gotten that impression? Um, they're getting a little better and there's actually professional playwrights um, 
like making a living doing, you can, there's even films, you can go to a film cl uh, camp with a bunch of other Orthodox girls and learn and make a film throughout the summer by a broad, not Broadway, by a Hollywood filmmaker who has returned to orthodoxy so that it's actually semi-professional and they even like get rabbinic uh, permission to have a male crew and um, so we're, they're, the whole scene of Beis Yaakov production is getting immensely more sophisticated than it was when I experienced it. Does that begin to answer the question? Do you have anything more to say about Beis Yaakov plays or production? Just one thing that I, in second grade, I got to play Yosef and Yosef Mokir Shabbos, the story about a Joseph and a stone and a fish. And it was the most thrilling thing to get to wear pants, like, on stage. So they don't, I don't know if you noticed, they don't actually, um, the Beis Yaakov is moving to the right, and what you see here is women not wearing pants. If you look closely, they're actually wearing skirts that are shirred at the bottom, or whatever the word is, with elastic. Yeah. Um, and I just feel like my whole interest in being in a Beis Yaakov play would have just completely <laughs> evaporated. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Sorry, I wanted to ask you about the street signs in Israel. Yes. Um, because this does seem to be a, a point where it matters whether the story is true or not. And so my question is, first of all, at the time those signs went up, did people know that the story was, a myth, was mythological? And if not, then now, is there any kind of pushback against those signs? Because um, yeah. you don't want to, when you've got Holocaust denial on the go, yeah. to have memorializations that are in fact false? Um, I hear you. Um, I don't, you know, how many other mythical characters appear on the street signs in Israel for one thing, right? I mean, um, trying to remember the street sign, the streets I lived on. Um, the, uh, uh, as far as I know, they were mostly um, Lobby, the, people lobbied for them in the 40s, and it wasn't until the late 50s when the scholarly consensus has emerged. Um, what's interesting is there are, there, are now, there are few Orthodox, professional, academically trained historians in the Orthodox world, including Esther Farbstein, who's the, I think the Gera Rebbe's daughter-in-law, so the daughter-in-law of, of one of the most important Hasidic Rebbe's, and um, she uh, has one line in her great, she has a, you know, the Holocaust and Orthodox Jewry, and there's one line in her book, a footnote saying this is controversial, she doesn't want to talk about it. She's also, um, she, she has a little Beis Yaakov archive like I do. She teaches in a Beis Yaakov or in, I think, a, a, a Michala maybe. She has a little archive there. So, there are definitely people who are trying to be professional about this, and there are, there are many corners of Beis Yaakov where they do, will not allow this story to be recited. And there are other people who may kind of know it's controversial, but feel too drawn to it to let go of it. And then there are plenty of people who just believe it to be true. And um, in terms of whether, I, you know, I, I certainly would not recommend taking down, this is, you know, this, I, my feeling is this is an important part of, of uh, my personal cultural history. And this, you know, beautiful park in B'nai Barak, how many, how many uh, places are there in the land of Israel that are named after Jewish women, much less Orthodox Jewish women who are... So even if this street sign marks not a reality but a memory or a cultural truth, I think, um, I, I wouldn't, in terms of whether the anti-Semitic Holocaust deniers are going to finally get us on this one, I don't know. I'm, I guess, you know, I, I, I don't want my own, my own uh, thought world to be too determined by, you know, people who would hate me under any circumstance. So, hi, Naomi. Thank you so much for that. I, I love the kind of blending of of your historical account discussions of fiction and performance as well and how they kind of come together. I guess one of the, one of the many questions I have relates to, takes, takes us back to performance. And you were reminding me actually of a PhD that's being done in, a, in, the, in the department, sorry, there isn't a moment, 
which I'm supervising actually with, um, who's a student who's actually working on evangelical Christians in Texas, who, I'm sure you know this, who, and of course, this yeah, is also about- Yeah, she came to, where's Pamela? Pamela's here as she, well. She visited our class, right? What's her name again? Saliha. And Pamela's also- Oh, it's fabulous, it's so, fascinating. Uh, and it's fascinating, and of course, it, in a sense, it's about evangelical youth in Texas who are also engaged in not just performance, but also rehearsal. And I was thinking about the kind of relationship between your work and, and Saliha's. And one of the things that I think, if I ask what's at stake with Saliha, uh, who, are they, who, who are these people performing to? There's a sense in which I think evangelicals are clearly learning how to perform to some notional public, both to fellow evangelicals, but also to a, a wider American public. That, and I'm just fascinated in a sense by thinking who the public might be in relation to these performances that are uh, they're put on stage for other other specifically other women in the context of the school. Now, in one sense, of course, that looks very enclosed, but in another sense, what's going on on stage? It seems to me is that people are enacting roles that they would never be able to enact in everyday life, male roles and, and so on. So there's a curious sense in which you have a caused a, a subjunctive character to this performance on stage. It's, it's a kind of play acting and a kind of working out through uh, a certain kind of lives that they may never experience. And I haven't really worked this out in my mind yet, but I'm wondering whether there's a curious parallel between that and the kind of fictional character of these letters. There's a sense in which it, it doesn't quite matter if it really happened, but we're working through stories. We're working through yeah. powerful yeah. stories here yeah. in both kind of cases. Yeah. I don't know whether that's a question or a statement. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because in some ways, it's just for women and girls, right? Somebody, I actually provided the title for somebody else's book, and that just kills me. It's so hard to find a good title, and I just gave it away for free. There's a book coming out called For Girls and Women Only, which is about um, orthodox performance. It's what happens when you take 10 years to write a book. Um, and one of the things that's interesting about it is, like, who is the audience? Yes, the audience is women, but that sign when it says for girls and women only, that's on the street. All kinds of people walk by and they see that. And what you have is a performance of the exclusion of men. Um, and, and there's no parallel. In other words, you don't have here, this is orthodox female culture. It's full of these wild, crazy productions. And then the boys are doing the same thing in the yeshiva. They're not. They're basically sitting and studying the Talmud. Their time is more policed. They're supposed to study Torah. There's no parallel between these two worlds. Um, women are excluded from the centers of orthodox life. But in fact, this is an arena for the exclusion of men. And one of the things that I found in doing the historical research of what this looked like in the 20s and the 30s is that you have these girls dressed up like boys on stage, you know, they, they're putting on Joseph and his brothers, because how many more male parts can you get? And, um, and then they're putting on the Binding of Isaac, you know, it's like one male play after another. And so, so there's all, you know, God's a male, and the angel's a male, and probably the ram is a male, and the whatever, they're all males. And girls dressed up like that, and, and these plays were so appealing to the boys of the town, the orthodox boys were so curious about these plays that they would dress like women and girls to get to sneak into the place. And they actually had to put guards up to feel up the people who were right um, from, and uh, there was one story of a, 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 the Binding of Isaac is being performed and they discover two boys hiding in the balcony of the movie theater. They rented a whole movie theater. These are productions, even in the 20s. And the town rabbi had to like be brought in to wag his finger at the boys who had barricaded themselves in the balcony, which is just so bizarre. I mean, talk about, you know, Orthodox Jewry is a quite a queer kind of, let's say, culture, as so many are, despite also having females. So how that fits in with the hell houses, so, I mean, I think there's a similar, so these hell houses, if I remember Sally Goh's work, there, you come to a room and you witness an actual abortion, um, actual, played out, 
uh, in abortion is for some reason the one thing that I remember from her presentation. And um, you're supposed to be horrified into seeing, you know, God's truth and coming back to the Lord and whatever the language is for repenting your evil secular ways. Um, and what th this particular, th th it's the same combination of a kind of the official thing you're supposed to get, the official message, and what you actually get, there's a, 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 a new Yiddish professor at um, UC Berkeley, uh, Roni Mazal, who also grew up Orthodox and also left, and she, uh, the phrase is called um, off the derech, gone off the derech, and she has something called off the derech reading, which is this bad reading that you're supposed to get this message and you get that message. You're supposed to be sitting and reading the Torah and instead you're finding all the prostitutes and whoever David is sleeping with and you know, you're finding the dirty parts to the Bible. Um, so there's, there's just a, a, a kind of compli- and this is just so old and, and right, all these you know, all these, like, you grow up, um, you know, Jewish, you hear all these, like, horrific tales of torture and whatever. And, you know, I just remember kids' magazines with, like, the Spanish Inquisition. And then, you know, the Khmelnytsky massacres. And it was just, like, one, it's basically porn. Um, it, there's a kind of weird religious porn that, that, that I'm trying to, I'm trying to get my fingers on? No, I'm trying to get my... <laughs> You get what I'm saying? So, uh, yeah, the, 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 yes, patriarchal control. Yes, pornography. At the same time, right? Maybe it's an old story. On that note, I know you have some <laughs> plans for us still as your audience or your participatory yes, audience. Yes, I was hoping we could end with the rousing sing-along of the Bess Yaakov anthem. That sounds great Which too. is very First, catchy. So I'm going to hand over the mic to someone else. <laughs> so basically, you can just come, you know, Lomer Ale gain in, wait, how does it, what yeah. is the four? Lomer Ale, Lomer Ale gain in Torah's bed. Let us all go in the paths of the Torah. Why yeah. not, right? You've tried the other stuff. <laughs>